my name is Laura Giuliano, and I'm going to be interviewing Orlando Brigano, a veteran of World War II. He was in the 712th Tank Battalion, and today's date is May 16, 2001. Okay, we'll just start out with you know a few questions about your background prior to the war. So, can you tell us where you were, where you were born? I was born in Herkimer, New York. Oh, my okay, Pardon? can you tell us um, how you enlisted? Uh, I was drafted. You were drafted. Yeah, I was drafted. Uh, back when I turned 18 years old, I received in the mail a citation. We need you. So, <laughs> in fact, uh, where I had to go for to uh, check in it was only a block away from the house. I walked, left my house and walked right down to the uh -huh. army in Utica where it was at. And uh, that was it. Yeah. And so did you go off to basic from there? Yeah, from there uh, a little while later we took and they put us on a train and actually it took us four days and five wow. nights because uh, during the war, war was going on in uh, Pacific and they were taking bypasses, uh, uh, sidetrack yeah. just to get down to Camp Polk, Louisiana. I went to. Camp Polk, Louisiana. Yeah, and now it's Fort Polk, Louisiana. And that's, I was with the 8th Armored Division in Camp Polk, Louisiana. Wow. And that's where I went through basic training. And after we finished our basic training, they had a big, uh, uh, in fact, Bob Hope was there to Bob entertain Hope. us. It was like a, a half of a bowl. Mm -hmm. And after he got through his entertainment and everything, he drove in. He was a tank commander. He drove in, and uh, well, you know, Bob Hope was just a wonderful man. And after that, the general, who was General Green, he says, "We will go overseas as a unit, all together." He says. Mm -hmm. Two days later, they separated us and started to send us as replacements overseas. Okay. And from there, uh, I took and went to Camp Upton. From Camp Upton, got on a ship which happened to be the Queen Elizabeth at the time. And we landed in Scotland, in Glasgow. And then we took a train uh, down to Wells, England. That's just by Bath. Okay. Bath, uh, England. And uh, we were there for a few days, and then in the meantime, uh, the invasion started, and uh, then they put us on trucks, and they brought us down to the harbor. Well, I was going to the harbor when the trucks, the truck driver got lost. <laughs> she said, "Of course, well, great, we'll be the last ones in the convoy." Well, come to find out, it was dark, and we got there. It was foggy, and when we got there, we got on the ship. Well, uh, and. When we woke up in the morning, we were the first boat going across the English yeah. Channel. And what they had was a big uh, rod across with the chains that they would rotate in the water in case there was any mines. Uh -huh. And these the extensions used to take and hit the mine okay. to explode them. Well, then we got there and uh, we landed on Utah Beach. Oh You're doing great. On Utah Keep Beach. And uh, we got up during the invasion and then we got up in the top. In fact, I had to pull myself up. Uh, with a big uh, rope to try to get up a hill. Mm -hmm. So, like a cliff. And then we got on top of there. And uh, that's when I went with the 712 tank battalion from Normandy. Mm -hmm. So um, do you think that your training in basic prepared you for what you saw there at all? Well, you know what they say, I've learned an awful lot, but experience mm -hmm. is your best teacher. Mm -hmm. And so we got there and this fellow, his sergeant, came to get me. His name was Sergeant Leroy Moore. He's still living today. He lives in Michigan. And he saw that I was scared to death mm -hmm. because there was shelling going on, Something machine terrible. guns going on. And he says to me, he put his arm around me, he was a little older than I was, he says, Lindy, 
He says, it's the ones you can't hear that you have to be scared of. What I mean is, if you hear a gun go boo 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 boo, you hear, you're all right. If you hear a shell coming in, you're all right, but it's the ones you it's don't ones hear you don't hear, though. And, and be scared of. Yeah. And uh, okay. keep up and keep going. It's your, it's your day. <laughs> well, anyway, then uh, from there, I joined the 712 Tank Battalion from there, and I was with the 712 Tank Battalion from the beginning to the end. And uh, when I got there, we took and we went to a place called St. Marie Eglise. That's the town that we went to, maybe if, if you watched the movies, I, I don't know, mm -hmm. The Longest Day or the something. The Longest Day we watched. Probably. And uh, that, that town was mentioned. So, as reconnaissance and after we got in there and everything, we were looking around and, uh, excuse me for a minute, we were looking around and I came to this house, and this is this woman, and she called me over, excuse me. She says to me, little French woman, and she says to me, oh, she says to me, you look just like my son. He's in the army, he says, but I don't know where he is. I don't know if he's living or dead. She grabbed a hold of me, and she hugged and she kissed me. Believe me, you can curse Bibles. You don't have to know the language as long as you know hand, you have your hands in gesture. So, she took, and I don't know, she handed me this scapular. Now, if, you, if you're Catholic, you made your first Holy Communion, you know, this is what they give you to hang around your neck. Well, she gave me this, and she says, here, you take this. She says, so you will be protected through the whole thing. May the Lord watch over you and take good care of you. This way here, I, at least, I feel as though I'm giving it to my son because I resemble her son. Mm -hmm. Now, I've had this in my pocket for over 50 years, and I don't think a day goes by that I don't think of this woman. Because if you saw her, you, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And... I thanked her and kissed her, gave her a great big hug. And I says, I gave her a kiss and this is for your son. I says, I know he's all right. So then uh, we got as far as St. Lowe. Mm -hmm. And there was a standstill there. So, my goodness, we didn't know what to do. All of a sudden, there was a, the clouds lifted. And they had an air armada. In fact, it was the largest air armada I've ever seen. The planes came from England, and they also came from Italy, the southern part. And they focused on that area. They started to shut, drop their shells, you know, bombing that area. In fact, the ground actually shook. That's how close they were dropping. In fact, some of the bombs actually landed on the Americans themselves. We lost. Many American soldiers through this air armada. Well, after the armada, we went, started to go. Mm -hmm. And if anybody remembers George Patton, to me, he was the greatest thing alive. And uh, let's go. And off we went. And the next place we went to was called a place called the, the Phillies Gap. Now, the Phillies Gap was. We had the Germans surrounded, mm -hmm. and uh, naturally they didn't give up that easy. Mm -hmm. There was shelling and combat going back and forth both ways. So finally they, we caught them, they, we, they surrendered. And when we went in there, they even had horse-driven vehicles, trailer, you know, they pulled it with horses. Mm -hmm. uh, Wagons, 
carrying the ammunition and pulling the car or something, and there was bodies laying all over the place. And uh, even the, the animals were bloated because they were dead so long. And we took and went from the Phillies Gap after we got that. We went to Reams. Now this is the roof. You got the map here? Um, Okay, and we got to, we left, we came down and uh, went to Reims, France. Okay. And I think you remember the First World War, they signed the Peace Treaty in Reims. Mm -hmm. and then we went to Verdun, which is a medieval city. By medieval city means that in the olden days they put a fort mm -hmm. around, uh, you know, that. And from Verdun, we went to Pat and had us keep going, and we took him. We went to uh, to Metz. Uh, Metz is another fortified city, medieval city, and we were trying to take it over, you know. So eventually we did. Then General Patton got word that he had to go to Bastogne, bring your troops and everything go up to Bastogne from Metz. We left Metz and we went all the way up to Bastogne. We traveled that day. Cold weather was terrible. And uh, I don't know, about 80 miles or so. And we finally got there the next day there. And, and uh, then the word was, okay, let's go, let's take this place. And uh, so that's what we did. We helped uh, to break the line so like the fourth armor could go through and stuff like that. And it was so cold. As a matter of fact, I even froze my ears. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. My ear legs are frozen. You can squeeze them, do anything you want with them. <laughs> and they're always warm. And I froze my ears there because the little hats used to take and cover this much, mm -hmm. but this was exposed. And uh, from there, we took in, the, I don't know if you ever remember a place called Meeker, Meeker's Salt Mine. We researched that, we did actually, and we came across Okay, the now that's a town that, now when I say we liberated, not, it isn't just us alone. Uh -huh. You know, you got to take like the 9th Division, God knows how many other towns. Uh, uh, units that were involved in that. And uh, so we went to Meekers, which we helped liberate. There was these two young women in the nighttime, mm -hmm. and uh, they were looking for a doctor or mm -hmm. somebody that they can help because their girlfriend was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they took and they helped her we got somebody to help this girl that was pregnant and to have the baby. Mm -hmm. Being that we were so good to them, they in turn told us about the Meeker salt mm -hmm. mine. And in the salt mine was all of Hitler's treasures. Wow. There was gold, there was money, there was statues of you know, famous people. Uh, paintings by Gold, uh, uh, oh my goodness, uh, Rembrandt, and uh, all these famous artists in there, and God knows what else was down there. So then they took and they, so nobody would take anything. Uh -huh. Not that we would, <laughs> you know, but I mean to say is they took and they closed it off. Mm -hmm. And that's how they found it. That's how they found it. The so they refer to the Meeker salt mine, but in the salt mine was Hitler's treasures. It was anything imaginable that was worth a lot of money, and uh, even American money, as far as I got gold. And uh, well, anyway, from that point there, then we took in the uh, Can I look at this in there? Oh, right I can't get there. Oh, let me, let me see. Okay, then we took and we went to 
Koblenz. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, we went through the Maginot Line. Now, the Maginot Line was in the Alsace Lorraine area. And the reason why they put there, one time it belonged to France, the area, next time it belonged to Germany. So I think it was the French that took, oh. built the Maginot Line. So <laughs> they didn't know who it belonged to. Well, they knew who it belonged yeah. to. They were fighting over for all these years. And then we took and we went to uh, Koblenz. And from Koblenz, St. Vith. And on the way coming down St. Vith, we came across concentration camp. Can you tell us a little bit about that? The concentration camp was called the Flossenburg. Flossenburg Concentration Camp. Well, and then Hitler had what they call it, uh, the death march. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they took all the people out of there before we got there who were able to walk to bring them someplace else. And as we, I went in there and there was a lot of sick people there and everything in there. They had the, the crematory was down here. camps were up here. It was a stone quarry. Mm -hmm. And when a person would die or something, I don't know if you know what a coal card is. A coal card is you just put coal in it. Mm -hmm. And well, in this case, they put bodies in it and then they used to take and push the coal card uh, down. It used to come down where the crematory would flip. And the bodies used to go into the, the building. And uh, then they had prisoners there who were taken, take the shoes. I'm sure you see movies where and uh, piled up to the ceiling. Well, this is the same incident. And then they were taken, cremated them. But while I was up above, I saw the shot fall. Up. And uh, he was holding on to his hand like this. He was my age. He had to, prison uniform on. And I says to him, can I help you? And he says, no, 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 no. I says, all right. I had to run an errand. and I took care of what I had to do. And when I came back, this fellow was still, this fellow was still holding on to his wrist. I said, are you sure I can't help you? He says, no, 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 no. I said, how about a cigarette? He said, yes. Yeah. So I took I gave him a cigarette, and uh, I lit it for him, and that was the end. And then we went out from Flossenburg, which was terrible. Mm -hmm. Talk about it. It's hard to explain. You have to see it in order to, yeah. and the stench from the cremation was terrible. So yeah. then we took and we went down into uh, Czechoslovakia to Susis, Czechoslovakia. Well, that's 20 miles south east of Prague. Mm -hmm. And where the 11th Panzer Division surrendered to the 90th Infantry Division and us. So then the war ended where we were at in mm -hmm. uh, Susis, Czechoslovakia. So then they took us and they sent us back you know, after a period of time, nothing just happened. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, after a while, we had to go back into Germany. We went to a little town called Amberg. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we were there for a oh, You were sent home according to the points that you had. Well, I had 86 or 89 points. So they made me eligible be one of the first ones to go back. But, and uh, so came home, mm -hmm. was discharged. In fact, I got discharged and came home on my mother and father's mm -hmm. anniversary, mm -hmm. December the 5th. How could I forget that? And then I went in business with my brothers. We were mm -hmm store business 
And one day, maybe about eight, nine years later, this fellow came to clean the windows. It just happened to be that I stood there looking at the fellows cleaning the windows. And all of a sudden, this one fellow took and he put the brush down. He came in and he says to me, excuse me, he said, weren't you the fellow the one that helped me with my wrist? I said, yes. I said, you were in Flossenburg. He said, yes. Well, the reason why he recognized me and I recognized him is because over there we had enough time to look at one another. Mm -hmm. So when he told me that, he came in, he embraced me, he hugged me, and I'm very emotional, as you can tell as it was. He started to cry. I started to cry. My brother says, came to me and says, what's going on? I says, you won't believe this, how small the world mm -hmm. is. And uh, I said, I'll explain to you later. And they never did fix his wrist. And his name was Mike. The last name is Morosky or something like that. And I never worried about that as long as I knew his first name. And we were friends from that day on. There wasn't a thing. Uh, I'd ask him to do it, he'd drop everything, he'd take good care of me, he'd help me. So we had to go away to Ohio. But while we were gone, Mike used to help in the church, St. Valdemir's Church, mm -hmm. like at Bingo or whatever they could do. He had his own business, by the way. He started his own business, and naturally Mike was a customer of ours. We made him take care of our mm -hmm. place. So he told the priest it was raining, it was a hot summer day, and it was dark that night, it was, the rain was coming down terrible. So he told the priest, the, which was Father Michael, he says, I have to go home and close the windows because my, of my apartment, because the rain will be coming in. He says, go right ahead, Michael. So Michael left her in his little truck, and he got there, and he went down the road there, and he turned on to get out to the arterial. And as he turned to get out the arterial, a tractor trailer came on and hit him and killed him instantly. Well, that was the end of Mike and my great buddy. And uh, he had no one. His mother and father and a sister all died in Flossenburg. He was the only one left. And uh, he came over here and he met me, and we were like brothers. And uh, in fact, it was just the other day, uh, I got a, a call from a doctor, Terry Jack, from New York, from Manhattan. He lived in 58th Street in New York City. And he says, uh, are you so-and-so? And I says, yes, I am. He says, well, I was in the Flossenburg concentration camp. He said, I was one of the youngest ones that was there. He said, I was only 14 years old. And when Hitler was taking all the men out and everything to go on their death march, he says, I hid in the border room so they couldn't find me. And uh, I said, you did? He said, yes. And, uh, and that's how he escaped. Mm -hmm. So then with the time progressed, he came to the United States, became a doctor, very prosperous doctor, and he's in Manhattan. And he said, you know, he says, there's another fella in your area that's from Flossenburg. I says, there is. He says, yes. His name is uh, Julian Nopa. He has a Polish hour on Sundays on the radio WIBX, mm -hmm. and I think it's from ten o'clock to two uh, ten o'clock to twelve o'clock. So he gave me his number, 
He said, please call him because he's a friend of mine. I says, all right. So I took, well, had a very long, lengthy talk with Dr. Jerry. And uh, then through the excitement, I called this mm -hmm. Julian fellow. That's his first name. And uh, my God, he says, when he started talking, he started to reminisce. And he says, you know what I'm talking about? I said, oh, how well I do know mm -hmm. what you're talking about. And, uh, and he said, what do you remember the most of that place? I says, well, I said, tell you the truth, what's the stench, the smell, because it was all over. He says, I'm glad you told me that, because he says, that's what, besides all the heartaches and everything that he had there, he said, it's, I can still smell. Mm -hmm. So now I got a, another friend from Flossenburg Concentration Camp, and we keep in touch. And this Dr. Terry called again, and uh, her, I thought there was nobody even heard of it, but they really did. And uh, I can't believe it. Where I, Mike, my buddy, died, and I'm you know, picking up from where he left off wow. there. So, Sarah, do you want to ask me? Um, actually, there was something. You um, sat in Hitler's chair, I read. Can you tell yes, us about that? Yes, I certainly did. When, uh, during the war, we got down to Birch's Garden, mm -hmm. and to get into Hitler's mm -hmm. chair, you had to go up. Well, they had vehicles, but I was fortunate that I went up in an elevator. And it was a huge tunnel. And you had to drive quite a distance to get to the elevator. So when we got to the elevator, I said, what the heck? I said, if he can come up on this elevator, so can I. So we went up there. And uh, matter of fact, I have a picture in the scrapbook there, the photo book. Mm -hmm. So I says, uh, here was this long, beautiful mahogany table with a fireplace that I could stand in it. It was so huge that I would look like a log, but that's how big it was. So I took and I says, and I sat in Hitler's chair, and I says, well, I said, this is something I'll always remember. And I sat in this chair, and then I went out to the veranda, and the reason why Hitler built on top of the Hitler, they called the Eagle's Nest, the reason why that Hitler was from Austria. This way here, you can see Austria on this side, and you can see Germany on this side. And that's why he built it. And believe me, it was very luxurious, beautiful place. And I made it my business to go back there. So as the years progressed, we educated our children and everything. I said, I want to go back. To uh, Birch's Garden, hit for Seagull's Nest. So we went there and uh, took the elevator up, <laughs> and when we got there, they had made a tea room out of it for the round tables mm -hmm. and the chairs and everything. So I asked one of the persons that uh, were working there, I said, Well, what happened to the big table that? where Adolf Hitler sat. He ignored me, and he made believe he didn't know a thing. I said, that's mm -hmm. all right to myself. I know. I sat there, mm -hmm. and I have a picture of it. <laughs> and, uh, well, that was quite an experience, and it was in the fall of the year in October that we were driving up, and as we got up into the clouds, it was snow, and it was absolutely beautiful. And, uh, in fact, I had a snowball fight with my wife. <laughs> but uh, that was quite an experience. And Burgess Garden is a beautiful, beautiful little place. The, the house has got all these flower boxes on it, and all the flowers. When I was there during the war, and uh, uh, the men used to wear them, wear those little <laughs> leather pants. I don't know what they call them. And uh, just, just fabulous, just a beautiful place. So I could understand why mm -hmm. you went there. Okay. Not the way going up there, it was Gorin's uh, home and everything, you know, all the 
his uh, big wheels who mm -hmm. live nearby. Yeah. Yeah. Is that everywhere you went, or where else did you go? Oh my, uh, <laughs> yes. Went uh, all over? No, well, after the, you mean during yeah. the war? Or oh, after, after the war. After the war, I am uh, so glad you mentioned that. Is, uh, uh, we went to Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. Now, Luxembourg is where the Ardennes was, uh, the Battle of the Ardennes. And uh, so we were in the city of Luxembourg, and I took a train, my wife and I, and uh, I wanted to go to a place called Leeler. Now, Leeler was a place that we liberated, and we erected a monument there, the 90th and the 712 Tank Battalion. So uh, we took the train and we went. We got off to a clock, Got off at a place called Clairvaux. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, "Well, how do we get to the other place?" He said, "Well, there's a bus right over there." So we took it. Went on the bus. Mm -hmm. so it was packed. It was my wife and I and another lady. That's all there was on this big bus. Mm -hmm. And I told the man, I said, "I want to go to Lila." He says. Uh, Okay, he says, he drove the bus and let the lady off and then we kept going and finally got to Leeler. Mm -hmm. And I says to him, the way he parked the bus along the side of the road, I says, you know, there's supposed to be a monument here erected here for, because of the outfit that I was in. We erected it out and I said, where is it? He says, right there because the bus was hiding it. <laughs> so we went there and I saw that, and uh, which was a thrill. We walked around and everything, and so it was time to go back. And it started to rain, so this I said, "Now what are we going to do?" And all of a sudden, there was this house across the street where this fellow was putting things into his car. And my wife says, "Where are you going?" I said, "Well, I'm going to speak to that man." So I says to him, well, do you speak English? She says, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, I was here during the war, and that's our monument that we donated over. Well, first, you know, he spoke better English than I did. <laughs> and, uh, and I told him the situation. I said, now we got to go back to uh, Clairvaux to catch the train to go back to, to Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. I'll take. So he got it, he put us in his car, and we took and drove us all the way back to Clairvaux. And on the way going down, driving back to Clairvaux, the bus came up, and they both tooted their horn at one another. One way, the other way. He said, no, you met my whole family. That's my cousin, he said, uh -huh. the bus driver. So we took and uh, went to Clairvaux, and uh, we had time. We had lunch there in a beautiful restaurant. And then we got back on the train, went back to Luxembourg. And then I wanted to go to a place. Um, I think that little picture. The small, the small series. Mm -hmm. When I was, when we were in the store, there was this gentleman. He was always came into the store, and I, his name was Adolf. And I says to Adolf, I says, "Where are you from?" He says, "I'm from Luxembourg." I said, oh my God, I said, I was in Luxembourg. He said, you were? I said, yes. I said, in fact, I've got a picture. And he says, you do? I said, gee, he says, I paint, he says. I would like to paint it. He said, would you bring it in? I said, sure. So when I thought of it, I brought it in and I gave it to him. I says, Adolf, I said, when you paint the picture, leave the three of us off and paint it. Well, it came Christmas time. Wouldn't you know, he had me this package. I said, what's this? I had completely forgotten about it. And he says, open it up. And when I opened it up, there was this picture here that he, and now this is the Petrus Valley in Luxembourg. Well, I took and I was, I was thrilled to pieces. Oh my goodness gracious. I says, uh, then my wife and I decided, well, we had gone back to Luxembourg when we went to Luxembourg. I want to go see the same bridge where I was sitting at. So I took 
My wife and I, it was no problem come going. It was all downhill. It was just great. So wouldn't you know, this is the only bridge in Luxembourg that in the Petrus Valley. So I had no trouble finding it. <laughs> so my wife says, hop up. I said, you got to be kidding. I said, I can barely walk. And you want me to jump up <laughs> on top of this? Well, anyway, um, we took another picture. And uh, this is the same bridge. And this is my wife and I in Luxembourg in the Petrus Valley. Wow. Uh, going back over 50 years. And if you notice the, well, it's hard to tell, but the foliage has grown since then. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then we had to take, to go back up. Mm -hmm. Well, finally, I thought I was going to have a heart attack <laughs> going up there. We got up on top. So the next day, I said, I want to go to the American Cemetery in Luxembourg. And so we had to take the bus. The bus took us to the airport. The airport, we got another bus to take us to the air, to the cemetery. To the cemetery. So when we got to the cemetery, well, oh my God, I had a friend of mine that was dead and was buried there. His name was Louis Allinger. Well, if you're a person like myself, that went through what I had gone through. And you see all these white crosses. Oh my goodness gracious, man. I couldn't control myself. Mm -hmm. So finally this gentleman came over and he says to me, are you looking for the general? I said, yes I am. He says, there he is, right behind you, which was General Pat. And then he took his arm. He says, these are all his heroes. Well, that's all he had to do to me. And the way he did it was really unbelievable. Mm -hmm. To go through that, you have to witness it yourself. Mm -hmm. But I'm, the way I feel and the way I'm trying to express myself. So he says to me, what are you doing after you, you get visiting here? I said, well, I says, we're going back to, to our hotel in Luxembourg. He said, no. He said, how would you like to see the German cemetery? I said, I'd love to see the German cemetery. So he says, uh, his wife was German. And uh, he said, when you get through, he says, no, don't rush. He says, meet me at the gate. So when we got through and I walked around and everything, I, I couldn't find Joe's grave. There's so many of them. Mm -hmm. And clean as it was, some neat. Well, anyway, uh, we finally got through. We walked to the gate. Here's this fellow that comes up with a big Mercedes Benz. He says, "Okay." He says, "Hop in." There was another gentleman with him and a lady. There, so we, my wife and I sat in the back. And he took us to the German cemetery. Now, in the German cemetery, there's two soldiers buried in the grave, mm -hmm. and their graves, their 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 crosses are grayish looking. Mm -hmm. And but it was a beautiful place, but. It's sad. Mothers and fathers lose their kids. It's I don't care who same. you are. It's all the same. So he says, okay. He says, where are you staying at? And I says, uh, Hotel Mobiles. He says, uh, how are you going to get there? I said, well, I have to take the bus back to the airport. He said, nah. He says, I'll take you back. <laughs> so we were lucky there. So he says, what are you doing Thursday night? I says, uh, Nothing that I know of. He says, how would you like to go to the opera? <laughs> I said, well, I'd love to go to the opera. How about you, Rose? She says, sure. <laughs> I got nothing. He says, I'll need two tickets at the opera for you to pick up in your name. And as he was taking us back to the hotel, in fact, he said, there's the opera right over there. I says, okay. And so the next day, which happened to be Thursday, was the day I went to the Petrus Valley. And when we got through there, I says to my wife, you know, I'd like to know if there's going to be tickets there. Now that I didn't yeah. believe or I didn't trust him, and I says, I'd like to know if the tickets are there for us. She said, well, let's take a bus ride and go. So we got on the bus, and 
I told the bus driver I wanted to get off at the opera, and he says, uh, he says you sit right next to me, he says, and, and I'll take you. So we went down, he says, and there's the opera, he let us off. When we got off, we started walking for, to the opera house. Now this in the afternoon, late afternoon. Mm -hmm. So as we were driving, walking up, this car drove up, and he says, are you going to the opera tonight? I says, yeah, I says, I hope to. He said, well, look, he says, I have two tickets here. He said, I'll let you have them for $100 each. <laughs> now, that's how expensive the tickets wow. are. I said, no, thank you. I said, thank you for asking, but I said, we have our tickets already into the, the opera house. I looked at my wife and had my fingers crossed. So he went to the desk there, and I says, uh, do you have two tickets for tonight's opera for Mr. and Mrs. Bergano? She says, I don't understand you. He went in the back. He called this other gentleman out. He says, can I help you? I said, yes. Uh, Michael Davison left two tickets here for Mr. and Mrs. Bergano. He said, did you say Michael Davison? I said, yes, I did. By the computer, <laughs> two tickets came out. He I says, thank you very much. He took and we left, went home. We had supper and that, because they, everything starts later there. It's not. It's not around, here. Like around here. So we had something and we dressed up to go to the theater and when we got onto the bus, the man I assistant, I want to go to the opera. He said, Yes, sir. He gave us a <laughs> smile because we were all dressed up. He took us to the opera. I said, Well, I said to my wife, by the way, I can just imagine we're I'm not being facetious or anything like that. <laughs> just imagine <laughs> where the seats, <laughs> seats, seats are. And over there, you, when you go there, you have to go and present your tickets to the lady there would be a receptionist. Mm -hmm. She would take and guide you to where your certain seats were. Wow. When she took us in there, we were in the center, four seats from the front uh -huh. and leather seats. I says, oh, oh wow. my God. I said, we don't <laughs> believe this. And after a while, the opera started. And guess who was the star of the show? Oh. Michael Davison was the head oh. star. And Don Carlos was the name of it. It was an Italian opera, mm -hmm. and they had the, uh, the translations right up above, so in case you didn't understand it, you wouldn't know what they're talking about. So I draw the label of our. Oh, that's the same thing. Yeah, here. this will work fine. Oh, this belongs to the back yeah, of the That's ones. right, that's right. Because that one there, I'm quite proud of. some of these lights off? No, all just like it is is perfect. This is great, Lindy, just like you are. No, I, uh, you got me now? Yep. Okay. See, I Lindy, with all of your experiences throughout the war and all the many things you saw and the many things you did and all these memories, if you had any final thoughts that you would like to close with for this video, what might they be? Well... I like to say one thing. I wouldn't want anybody to go through the experience that I went through at my early age. And uh, there's no words that can express it. Just hope that we never have another war or anything. Let there be peace. And I'd like to show you these medals over here. Would you if please? I can. Uh, well, first of all, excuse me. When I started off in the show, I went to Camp Polk, Louisiana. I joined the 8th Armored Division. And then, as you know, through the, our conversation, I went overseas to Normandy and uh, the invasion. And I joined the 712th Tank Battalion. Well, then. 712 tank, tank Battalion was attached to the 90th Infantry Division. That's TO, which means Tough Hombres, to the 90th <laughs> Infantry Division, which they were. Now, I don't know if this is good or bad, but I don't think it's too good. They're, the 90th Division was turned over two and a half times with personnel. And then over here, 
is the five battle stars that I got for every one of, every one of the major battles in the European theater. And uh, that's one of was the American Camp, a Good Conduct Medal, the American Campaign, the European Medal, the Victory Medal, and World War II Occupational Medal. And, uh, and this one here, the little one over here is uh, the Army Meritorial Unit Citation. I don't think there's too many outfits or too many people receiving that one there. Plus, uh, the French government came over personally and presented me with a few other fellas the Golden Jubilee Medal of the Invasion of Normandy, which was over 50 years ago. Now, Mr. Henry Lafleur came over and presented to us this personally. And this one here is given to us by the State of New York, Governor Pataki, and that's the, the Medal of a Conspicuous Medal for services rendered in the service. And I, I guess that's it, so God bless you all.